Welcome to the Potter Blog site, March 26, 2015. Exposure to more than one cubic millimeters worth of Ebola-infected blood will overwhelm the known Ebola vaccines. And that's what you see here on my finger, is a rep representation of one cubic millimeter of blood. I'm going to zoom out here so you get an idea how small this is. You can see it's a tiny amount, a very tiny amount. So the question is, well, how much Ebola is actually in that tiny amount of uh, Ebola-infected blood? Well, we gathered this information from the Ebola Vaccine Conference. It's an eight-hour-long conference that the National Institutes of Health put out, and we will play these snippets that back up what we're telling you <coughs> excuse me at the end of this video give you some idea of where this data comes from but uh, for now what you need to know is is that there are three things very few people know about Ebola vaccines and we suspect that these three three things are behind the unprecedented healthcare worker Ebola outbreak in uh, Sierra Leone. The first thing we already told you, exposure to more than one cubic millimeter of Ebola infected blood overwhelms the vaccine. That one cubic millimeter you saw on my fingertip, that is enough Ebola virus to infect 1,000 monkeys, either through the aerosol route or uh, intramuscular route. So if you cut that little piece of blood up into a thousand pieces, it could infect a thousand monkeys. Moreover, it is enough to reliably kill 100% of the time 100 monkeys. The other thing to realize is that uh, FDA normally requires 10 years of vaccine dosing safety studies uh, before they'll release a vaccine. Well, in the case of Ebola, that's been whittled down to just three months of guesswork, as stated in this NIH video conference. One of the points I want to make is that we're compressing what's usually five to ten years of work of careful dose finding and everything else down into three months. And, and the third thing that comes into play here is Ebola vaccines have induced early Ebola type symptoms in those people who were given them. So those three facts bring us to the very unusual Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, uh, Sierra Leone among healthcare workers. Strangely, that outbreak coincide, coincided with the planned vaccination of foreign healthcare workers in Sierra Leone. The plan was to start uh, vaccinating the healthcare workers in Sierra Leone about right a few days before this uh, outbreak with these healthcare workers happened. Now, this is just a hypothesis, at least of what happened in Sierra Leone. That the hypothesis is, is that uh, they vaccinated these healthcare workers. Uh, one of them had a reaction to the vaccine and came down with Ebola-like symptoms. That person was also then exposed to Ebola through their work. And because of that exposure and because they had the vaccine, they started having Ebola symptoms. They blamed the Ebola symptoms on the vaccine instead of on the fact that they acquired Ebola from a patient. And because of that, they kept on doing their work, and that resulted in, I think, a total of, I think, 20 healthcare workers, foreign healthcare workers exposed to the Ebola virus. Now, that is just conjecture. The fact that uh, the Ebola vaccine doesn't protect against uh, much Ebola-infected blood, that's not conjecture. The fact that uh, 10 years worth of safety vaccine dosing levels have been whittled down to three months is not conjecture. The fact that Ebola vaccines have induced e early Ebola-type symptoms is not conjecture. But this outbreak amongst healthcare workers in Sierra Leone, in Sierra Leone was unprecedented. And we detected this early on, and uh, we tweeted about it. And what really caught our attention was when all three Ebola air ambulances were dispatched simultaneously to West Africa. And we tweeted about this on March 12th, although we started noticing the first ones prior to that. 
it turned out, I believe, that they made uh, seven or eight flights, and they turned several of these aircraft rapidly, almost same day, to get back to Africa. Uh, what ended up happening is 16 people were brought to the United States. Uh, one of them for sure Ebola infected. Uh, there were Ebola exposed people in, I believe, Honduras and New Zealand, and some Ebola infected people also taken back to the, the UK, all tied to this situation. So, brings us back to what has happened here. And that is that conjecture we had. But, there's more to this that you need to know about. What's not conjecture is, is the public is being sold a billion dollar load of polls when it comes to the Ebola vaccine and their stockpiling of it. But as we said, don't take our word for it. That's why we're going to show you the video clips from this eight hour NIH uh, immunology of protection from Ebola virus infection video commerce, conference. Uh, the three key takeaways from that conference are the experts freely admit that even exposure to vomit is enough to overwhelm the Ebola vaccine. They also state that the current Ebola challenge dose being used simulates a person in a biosafety level 4 spacesuit having a minor needle prick and being exposed to a measly 1 cubic millimeter of blood. And the vaccine producers would like to cut that challenge dose down to by a factor of 100 times. So the reality is, is that the Ebola vaccine was designed to protect somebody who had their spacesuit fail and the most minimal amount of dose came through. And so let's go to some clips from the video conference as we, uh, as we promised you. Uh, first, we'll go with uh, this discussion right here. This will tell you where they freely admit that the vaccine will fail. I have no doubt that there will be failures. These vaccines are not going to be 100% protective, if only because the issue of challenge dose is key. And in the presence of a large challenge dose, uh, someone who is exposed to uh, uh, vomitus uh, with a high titer of virus, I, I expect that there will be vaccine failure. So again, that comes down to challenge dose. And the challenge dose we showed you was that one micro, microliter of blood uh, which is one cubic millimeter blood. That's what we showed you on our fingertips earlier. So how lethal is that one microliter? Well, let's look at this one, give you an idea. The challenge which Pete mentioned is a thousand PFU um, delivered intramuscularly. And just to tell you in this model, we've titrated down to 10 PFU and that's uniformly lethal. So the challenge dose was 1,000 PFU. Now let's look at that and let's look at that chart here again. The challenge dose was 1,000 PFU. PFU stands for plaque forming unit. One plaque forming unit is the smallest amount of virus that is required to grow more virus. In the terms of Ebola, Basically, it seems to work out that one virus particle is one PFU. So what uh, was just stated in this clip was, is that they challenge with 1,000 PFUs, but they can cut it down to 10 PFUs, cut it down by a factor of 100, and still kill every monkey. And it turns out that several people at this conference want to cut the challenge dose down to 10 PFU. And that brought up some more comments I'll show you here. Here's somebody who wants to cut it down to, to 10. I think the challenge dose is too high. And so here was a response to that statement that the challenge dose was too high. Well, fundamentally, we figured that is a very realistic dose by any root, needle stick, oral, conjunctival, etc. And we reckon that if we, whatever our approach was, if it didn't protect against 100 or 1,000 PFUs, it ought to be laid down and pursue something that did. Uh, so it didn't much matter to us if we could protect against 3 PFUs, if we couldn't protect against 100 or 1,000. That was, that was the logic that informed this. That can be changed communally. I noticed that. So even though it was designed for that level, 
they are still willing to change it and water it on down. Uh, we have one more here. Let's go to our web page here. So we have Peter Jarling. Can you say anything about why we're using a thousand LV uh, PFUs or what the consequences would be or the temporal course of the disease would be if you used a 10 PFUs, for instance? Well, you know, you could argue that if you want to set the bar low, you can probably give a very low dose. I, I think the, um, the assumption, you go way back, you know, 15 years when we first started doing these things, I think if there was any thought given to it at all, it was that if viremia in a patient is on the order of six logs and you have a needle stick, uh, the volume of blood in that needle is probably uh, about a, um, a, a microliter, and that translates to 10 to the 3. And, I mean, you, you can accept that or not, but, I mean, um, if you're looking to protect against uh, infection, I mean, yes, you can dilute down to extinction and kill a monkey, but I think a, a, a reasonable dose, I mean, I don't think 1,000 PFUs is an overwhelming dose. So there you have it. Now, there's also a good nugget in there about uh, where that 1,000 PFU came from. Uh, if you said it was from a monkey with, uh, they based it on getting a needle stick through a spacesuit from a monkey with a uh, viremia, that's the amount of virus in the blood, in the order of uh, uh, 10, to, 10 to the 6 logs, that's only a modest amount of uh, Ebola viremia. So, that one cubic millimeter of blood was based on getting a needle stick from a monkey that is moderately sick with Ebola. And the monkeys start dying reliably when they get up to a uh, viremia level, I think, of uh, uh, to the 10 to the 9th. So if you got stuck with a, uh, by a needle prick from a monkey who was on its deathbed or already died, there would be a thousand times more virus in that drop of blood than the one I, sh than the one, uh, I simulated for you on my fingertip a moment ago. So, this virus is incredibly, incredibly infectious. And that brings us on to the next aspect of this, something the CDC is doing with the people who uh, they evacuated back to the United States the healthcare workers that came in back on all these flights. Uh, there was one who definitely had Ebola. The rest were exposed. Well, they took the people who weren't showing symptoms yet and they lodged them in hotels outside of the designated Ebola hospitals, I think in Atlanta, Omaha, and outside the NIH. Now they did this to save money. And they did this based on uh, the information that uh, people who've been infected with Ebola had not in, infected anybody that we know of uh, until they started to show symptoms so they believe it was safe. It saves them a lot of money but here's the really really dangerous downside to that. There's a lot that's unknown about Ebola and there's a nightmare scenario and that is that somebody is infected with Ebola through the inhalation route not from touching it, but that Ebola first infects them in their lungs. And if Ebola first infects them in their lungs, they will cough prior to having the other Ebola symptoms. And they will release Ebola in the aerosol version prior to having symptoms. And it only takes an insanely small amount of Ebola to be released in an aerosol version to begin infecting people, dropping them like flies. Now the reason why this hasn't been seen, we suspect, in Sierra Leone or in West Africa is because those locations are on the equator. Just like flus and colds don't spread along the, along the equator because the weather's warm. Most of these people are being infected through contact. <coughs> Some may be infected uh, through the aerosol route, but it's being overwhelmed by those people being affected by the contact route and that's because it's so warm there. You bring somebody with Ebola who's shedding it through their lungs into a cold weather climate and it has the potential of spreading worse than the flu and being non-stop and that is a an extreme risk that the CDC is taking. 
uh, you know, the the uh, the amount of risk that they're taking, the consequences if that happens are insane. I mean, that is, an, and it, if it starts to spread that way, you can't measure the amount of money and suffering that this Ebola outbreak would cause. So they're saving a few dimes by ho housing these people who, in hotels. If any of those people have aerosol version. Well, I don't know what we can say. It's just horrible.